and Cassell's, an excellent book, The Internet Galaxy. Uh, I recommend you all have a read of that because it gives a very good perspective of what the internet, I say is, but was at the time. Uh, and some of his stuff is still relevant today, but that particular book, The Internet Galaxy, uh, was quite good in, uh, and useful for me because uh, it helped to define different cultures of the internet. And uh, we'll just go into a few of those, uh, a bit of that right now. I'm not focusing on uh, Turkle's work um, because it, it wasn't too relevant for what I was doing uh, later on. But he said uh, that there's a four layer structure. There's a techno meritocratic culture, which is uh, to do with the people who are building the internet essentially, the, uh, the guys responsible for uh, the architecture, uh, the hackers. Now the, now, the word hacker, we sort of have negative perception for that, but the hacking culture was very, very important in the early days of the internet uh, because the hackers were actual programming experts. And it was, you could argue, a form of rebellion uh, within the internet uh, because of some of the activities that they embarked on. But a lot of what they did was actually quite positive. That term hacker was uh, possibly the wrong term to use. And I'll give you a, a typology later on which maybe defines their role a little bit better. And the virtual communitarian culture, that's where we're at at this point in time when we talk about social media, virtual communities. And the last, and also probably least, is the entrepreneurial culture. The reason I say least is because it's the one which is taking over now. It's the one where uh, um, everything is becoming commercial. Uh, but it's the one which least understands the internet. It's the one that least understands how this medium works and how to utilize it. In fact, what the entrepreneurial culture does is it looks at the other three and it says, how can we sell products to them? Uh, as opposed to saying, let's embrace this technology which is here. And once we embrace it, perhaps it will become a little bit more fun for us. There may not be a profit in it straight away, uh, but ultimately what might happen is uh, people will like us. And if they like us, they might like what we have, have to offer them. That philosophy uh, didn't exist at that point in time. And it was quite refreshing uh, to to again look at a cultural perspective of how the internet is broken down. If you look at traditional things like uh, Swinyard and Smith who, who did a typology of online shopping behavior. Sounds quite boring. Uh, it was quite boring. It was useful for those who are into interested in that uh, field of research, uh, but for what I was doing, it wasn't enough. It didn't tell me what I needed to know. I needed to know who these people were, not just when they're shopping, but who these people were full stop when they're online. And again, I say when they're online, not when they're offline or in general. And there's a deliberate reason for that. So I then uh, got a a, a semi-colleague, I'll say, uh, um, Maren Hartman, she wrote this uh, a theater PhD thesis, actually, um, about the internet. And the reason I was interested in this be is because she developed a methodology called a virtual archaeology. So what she did is she essentially looked at old websites and looked for footprints of the people who had been there and tried to see what they had done uh, in the past. And she, she actually used a methodology which would have been used 60 years prior by a, a gentleman called Walter Benjamin, uh, the Arcades Project. You can read that if you want, it's a very long book and it's unfinished. So if you're thinking of a book which has got an ending, it doesn't have an ending. Because he, he, so so, he took so long making notes and notes and notes, he never got to actually give it an ending, give it a finishing. It was just observations that he had of um, the uh, French shopping arcades in the, the 1920s and 30s. Uh, he just observed the people that he saw and tried to classify them into, into different groups of people. Um, and she tried to replicate this on the internet because at the time the shopping arcades were quite new, quite modern, and uh, she felt it was appropriate for the internet, which was sort of quite new and quite modern or, or postmodern as, uh, as the term has been coined. And she developed a, a, user, uh, a user typology, which I then myself added a little bit to and uh, uh, changed to some extent. Um, her main character was the, the cyber flaneur. Um, some of these terms you might think, well that's a bit sort of eerie for it sounds a little bit uh, unacademic, the way they're, they're being described. But the point is that these were reflective uh, notes, these were reflective terms, these were reflections on internet users. And you won't find anywhere in any marketing paper, apart from maybe the ones that I've written, uh, somebody using terms like 
cyberpunk or cybernauts. Um, because what we're concerned with as, as marketers is, okay, shopper A, shopper B, shopper C. Customer A, customer B, customer C. So we're not classifying them as customers, we're saying these are individuals with identities. In many ways, what she did, and what I tried to do, was create a demographic profile based on these characters. So to say, okay, well how old is the typical drifter? How old is the typical netizen? How old is the typical cyber child? And this is why, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I'm referring to the internet user in the third person. Because depending on how much experience you have of using the internet, that will sort of vary uh, what kind of age you are as an internet user. It changes your cultural perception as an internet user, depending on how much exposure you have to the internet. And when I got into my research into uh, uh, business ethics, then I explored this in a bit more detail and said, okay, well, this user is this old, they've been uh, a member for that long, uh, they're this advanced, um, uh, they have certain interests. So we could categorize them a lot more when we start to consider everything that they do on the internet, not for a commercial reason. That's never been my goal. That's never been my goal to try and develop a model so that I can sell it and say, uh, here you are, um, uh, Boston Consulting Group, here's a, a user typology, uh, and you can now sell to these people. No, you will never ever be able to sell anything to any of these people. Because if you try to sell to them, they won't buy it from you. If you get in a relationship with them, then they might adopt things from you. Then they might start to take things from you. Then they might become interested in what you have to offer them. But not before that point. And you can only get into a relationship with these guys if you have similar interests. And so I started to look, okay, well this is how uh, the cultural theorists have done it. Is there anything out there which tries to apply the cultural theory to uh, e-marketing? So I had to pick a methodology. <coughs> Ethnography. It refers to a method or set of methods. And I've taken this broad definition just so that you guys can uh, sort of have a look at how, how I view it as opposed to how maybe it's viewed by uh, other people. So traditionally associated with the, uh, the social sciences. But then it was adopted by, by this guy, Rob Kozinets. Works in uh, Canada. Well, these guys are still alive, by the way, which is the, the great thing. You can actually email them and speak to them and uh, get information from them, which is refreshing as opposed to reading a book by someone who's been dead for 20 years and how do you know it's still relevant? Uh, so, so this guy is very much uh, alive and kicking. Uh, he works in Canada. Spoken to him on a number of occasions. Very, very approachable. If you guys ever get interested into this methodology I'm going to talk about, uh, it's his methodology. I don't take any claim to it. I've done stuff to it, yes, but I don't take any claim to it. So he coined the term netnography. Uh, and he simply defined it as a written account of online cyber culture <coughs> informed by the methods of anthropology. In no, there's no mention there of a marketing method or a way of attracting customers or anything like that. So this is an actual marketer who has now done what I was hoping to do, but because I was a teenager in 1997, I didn't do it back then. Um, so uh, he did it a lot uh, earlier than, uh, than what I did, and he tried to develop a, a set of guidelines which would be useful uh, for carrying out ethnography with a, a marketing purpose or marketing agenda or from a marketing background. And there's been a number of uh, researchers who have adopted this methodology. And again, you might think of all of these things, well, is that product related? In, in any way, and, and it's not really. It's more subject related, but all of these classify as marketing research, pieces of marketing research. So he studied the science fiction subculture, so he looked at uh, X-Files and the uh, communities within, uh, or virtual communities that existed which discussed X-Files. Uh, we've got sensitive topics like cosmetic surgery, which was also discussed. So uh, they wanted to, uh, Langer and Beckman wanted to find out what people's views were on cosmetic surgery, in particular people who had it done, uh, intercultural message boards, educational delivery, so you can see the, the, the range of uses for this methodology. Now, it's also been used slightly more uh, deliberately in a commercial sense uh, with brand communities. So Nutella, the chocolate spread, they've got a brand community. 
go online, you can visit, people post pictures of them eating Nutella and they have sort of recipes on how to use Nutella. Um, and, uh, but, but the great thing about it is, you go on the website, you can't actually buy Nutella from the website. You can't buy a single packet of it. It's just, and it's not even promoting Nutella in many ways. All it's doing is people who have a shared interest, which is Nutella, are sharing photos of what they've done with it and sharing recipes and uh, experiences, if you like, uh, with Nutella. And they get together and, and, and it's the best form of marketing because it's effortless. It doesn't require Nutella to do anything. It's done by the actual uh, consumers themselves who are passionate about the product. It's all word of mouth. So why do we choose this particular theory, uh, this particular methodology to study uh, our online communities and social media? Why is it useful for social media? Well, the data is permanent. So your observations, uh, whatever you observe, that data is there, unless, as uh, we're alluding to a little bit earlier, somebody deletes something that they've commented on. But then even that has an analytical uh, relevance. Why has it been deleted? Are they possibly retracting what they said? Have they changed their position? Uh, on what they were saying before. There's something within that that you can, that you can look at. It's inexpensive, relatively, uh, to do this research. In terms of, uh, or it's in inexpensive compared to doing this kind of research offline. And that's the appeal to, to e-marketers now, is the fact that it is very uh, convenient and inexpensive, and it doesn't take as much time, because the threads are there, we have software which can analyze what people are saying in conversations, um, and you don't need to go into the level of detail that you possibly needed to go into with a traditional ethnography. 